Good morning. We welcome you this morning, both online and here in the sanctuary. Kathy, or Kate, is not with us this morning because she is on educational leave. Okay, and now we'll have, is there any announcements that should be noted? With that, we'll listen to Ryan do the prelude. Forgive me for not out welcoming the Reverend Tom Davis to our pulpit this morning in the absence of Kate. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And we're also glad to have Ryan back after his illness with COVID. The call to worship, can we do this responsibly, please? Let the Creator be home among us. In our hearts, may God be welcome. Be welcome. May God's love shape our every thought. May our actions lead to God's justice. May our words be words of life. May God's, May God's spirit, spirit lead us. us. May God's peace dwell within us. Amen. Let us turn in our hymnal to hymn number 395. Blessed Jesus at your word.
Brothers and sisters, confident in God's grace, let us now confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray together. We have not yet learned to love as you love. We have spoken praise in our mouths when our hearts were far from you. The gifts you gave for our peace, we have weaponized. And yet even in our failings, your love has never failed us. Even when we turned away from you, you still choose to make your home among us. Our hearts are troubled. We are enmeshed in fear. Creation needs you. Our families need you. Our streets need you. Our cities need you. The soil needs you. Our souls need you. Heal us, forgive us, make us whole again. And will you read with me responsively? Hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone and a new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. We are indeed forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of the risen Christ is with you. So with you. You're invited to turn to the people around you and wave to each other <clears throat> as a sign of graceful greetings of this day. If you're at home, please take a moment to share God's peace in the comments section. The prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The New Testament scripture reading is from John 14, verses 24 to 29. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I was still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the word gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You hear me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe. Now this is this is a, what we call a volunteer. <laughs> I. Uh, I snipped it this morning. It's, it's healthy below that, so I'm sure it will reco recover. But in fact, we may just not take it in that particular place. But this was a prop for the children's sermon. They're not being children with us. I shall ask you. If you were to see this without a person holding it out in the wild and it were waving, what would you say is waving it? Huh? The wind, yes, of 
course, yes. In fact, uh, every day I look out the window, I have a wonderful picture window in the back, and I look out the window to see whether it's waving because if it's waving, it's not a good day for macro photography. That is, close-up photography. But if it's rather still, it is. So uh, regarding the wind, on your bulletin you see there the prelude title, Spirit of God Unseen as the Wind. So it's connecting spirit and wind, which is a very biblical concept. Did you know that in Hebrew, the word ruach means wind and spirit, both. And in the New Testament, in Greek, the word pneuma means, what do you think? Wind, wind and spirit. Right, right, right. And um, I think probably there's a similar kind of thing happening in other languages. I wonder whether in Chinese the word qi uh, refers to the same thing, breath and, and divine energy. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, breath is what human beings have associated with the energy of life. And that makes sense, right? Because when you're born, what's one of the first things a baby does? Ah! Takes in the first breath, cries, and begins to breathe. Hmm? And when a person dies, what's the last thing they do? They breathe out the last breath, right? All, all our lives, we are exchanging with the universe the air, the breath. And when we pass away, we stop exchanging. Okay. So my sermon, my adult sermon this morning, is about spirit. And it's also highly connected to breath. More on that later. So I'm going to borrow a piece of scripture from this coming Sunday, next week, uh, which is Ascension Sunday, from Acts, the first chapter, verses 8 through 11. You will receive power, uh, says Jesus, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going up, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them, and they said, Men of Galilee? Why do you stand looking up to heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May God grant us understanding of that very mysterious passage. Well, folks, you know who I am. But the folks on the internet, welcome to our service this morning. And I'm going to take a few moments to introduce myself to you. Uh, I am uh, Tom Davis, a Presbyterian pastor, retired but still active. And uh, that is the first hat uh, that I shall wear this morning as, as I share a message with you. I'm also the parish associate to this congregation. Uh, the second hat that I wear this morning is I'm a Vietnam veteran and the founder and the president of the Vietnam, I'm sorry, of the Interfaith Veterans Work Group. And our mission is to prevent veteran su suicide in the state of Delaware. And the third hat that I shall wear in this sermon not many of my friends know about this hat, is that I studied philosophy way a long time ago. Have a 
master's degree in it, actually. And uh, I like to exercise it in a kind of unofficial way. And I shall hope to do so this morning. Three hats. And you will hear me putting on one or another as I share this message about spirit is our guru. I met a guru this last week. His name is Ravi Shankar. He's better known to his followers by the honorific title Sri Sri, S-R-I-S-R-I. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar visited the Kimmel Center in Philadelphia last Tuesday to host an educational and an inspirational event on the theme of standing for peace, a very important subject these days with the war going on in Ukraine. And I attended the event because Sri Sri asked especially for interfaith attenders to come. I qualified as one of those because I'm one of about a dozen advisors, uh, religious advisors, to the governor of Delaware, Governor Carney. So I went along with a Hindu friend, uh, Pramod Mathur, who is a member of the uh, temple in Hokesson, Delaware. I was eager to meet Sri Sri because he is the inventor of a meditation technique called sky breathing. That's not a metaphor, that's an acronym, which stands for Sudarshan Kriya, which is a form of yoga. Now, military, pra uh, military veterans practice a slightly modified version of sky breathing called power breath. And as a veteran, I received power breath training, and so did my wife Alice, and we have been practicing sky breath I for about four years, and she for three. And every morning, the first thing that we do when we rise is we spend about 40 minutes uh, practicing this technique of breathing first in slow and then medium and then faster paces, and using hand and arm postures, which expand the various regions of our lungs. This one for the lower region, this one for the middle region, and that one for the upper region. Perhaps you may know that the body and the mind are intimately related, inter inter interconnected. The condition of the body affects the mind, and the condition of the mind, in turn, affects the body. A daily practice of sky breathing, or power breath as the veterans call it, helps to clear and calm the mind and keep the body healthy. Many veterans have found that power breathing has been helpful in alleviating symptoms of post-traumatic stress. We really highly recommend it as an excellent natural mental health booster. And as a civilian, you can get this training from The Art of Living. The Art of Living is the NGO, the huge organization that Sri Sri Ravi Shankar founded. So, back to his visit. Picture this, if you will. I am standing in an elegant, elegant, well-lit room at the top of the Kimmel Center with full glasses, full pa panels of glass from the floor to the ceiling, and uh, about a hundred guests are gathered there awaiting the arrival of their guru. Guru means simply teacher. By watching videos of Sri Sri's meditations, I had already observed, however, that he is regarded as much more than a teacher. He is adored. I think it's fair to say by some followers, he is venerated as something like a saint. I wait a long time for him. I'm eager to see him. And finally, he arrives in a long white robe, a man just slightly taller than I, and I'm not very tall, with a graying beard and uh, dark, twinkling eyes and straight hair falling over his shoulders. A crowd of mostly Hindu devotees are drawn immediately to him like chicks to their mother hen. 
And as I watch all this, I become aware of a feeling in me that is disturbing. For I am not drawn to, to him as they are. I am skeptical. I am resisting Sri Sri's charisma. Who is this guy, I wonder? And is he really, is he for real? Charlatans can take people into their charisma and take them for advantage. But I can find no evidence that Sri Sri is using people in this way. The organization that he founded, The Art of Living, is the large, one of the largest NGOs in the world. It has a sterling record of humanitarian service feeding and clothing and sheltering and healing hundreds of thousands of people, really. And yet, I am still cautious, maybe even just a little suspicious. There must be a fly in this ointment somewhere, I'm telling myself. And then it hits me. Maybe my caution, my reticence to entertain a deep admiration for this famous person, is due to my Presbyterian upbringing. For we Presbyterians are noted for our wariness of lodging too much authority in our leaders. We elect our leaders for limited terms of service. We may admire them greatly, but we do not venerate them. And we regard all seekers as saints, though they may not yet be truly saintly, we positively do not accept the historical office of bishop. No way. Our church government is carefully scripted in a constitution by three, pa uh, three branches of government and checks and balances to guard against too much power accruing to any person or body of people. And all this seems quite practical and admirable given that we must cope with evil in the world and in our own tribe. Presbyterian polity does indeed equip us pretty well for doing things decently and in order, as Paul said we should. And still, while I was finding myself resisting the charisma of Sri Sri, I was thinking, doesn't he look a lot like Jesus? <laughs> he does. Many paintings I've seen of Jesus, and yes, there are slight variations according to the, uh, the imagination of the painter, but my goodness, he looks like a lot of those Jesuses I've seen. And also the way that Sri Sri's devotees act in his presence, rather like the scripture tells me, the devotees of Jesus acted in his presence. Jesus' popularity was not always steady. The sixth chapter of John's Gospel reports that some followers of Jesus were beginning to fall away. And Jesus was wondering whether the 12 were fixing to leave him too. You remember the reply. Peter said, where would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. Well. Many of Sri Sri's followers exhibit a similar confidence in and a similar devotion to him. I do recognize that my resistance to Sri Sri has an understandable derivation given my Presbyterian upbringing, but I also realize that by holding him, as it were, at arm's length and not being willing to spiritually embrace him as a brother may hamper my ability to resonate with the truly lovely spirit that I observe in him. And you know, I think, I just have this feeling that that spirit that I perceive in him was the same spirit that was in Jesus of Nazareth when he, as Paul said, or not Paul, but John, when Jesus pitched his tent among us. Well, this intuition leads me to the title of my sermon, Spirit is Our Guru. 
Well, let me jump ahead now to that Ascension passage that I read of next week. On Ascension Sunday, we will read the story of the departure of Jesus from this world as his disciples watched him go up into the sky. Taken literally, I don't know what to do with that passage. I'm a 21st century believer, and I think scientifically at least try to a lot of the time. And frankly, I don't know what to do with that passage. What happened to Jesus' body, pray tell? Did it just evaporate? Frankly, I get lost if I pursue that literal line of inquiry, but let's hear the story in another way. Maybe that story is more about what happened, not so much to Jesus, but to his disciples. When they finally had to deal with his departure, and his absence soon thereafter. If we hear it in that way, the Ascension story re resembles a very, very common story to us all. Because when a loved one dies, we face such a grievous challenge of accepting their departure, their absence, and then what to do next. We affirm that something about the person remains, right? The body is dead and gone, but spirit remains. We feel that. Well, I will attempt soon to define spirit. Needs to be done. But first, let me get something out of the way. To many people, the very idea of a disembodied spirit seems spooky. <laughs> Jesus wanted his disciples not to be scared. And he told them that the spirit that they would soon receive would not be scary. It would be a comforter. Their advocate when the going gets tough. And also their teacher. Their guru, if you will. Who would remind them of all the kind and wise things that Jesus had taught to them, both by his words and his deeds. The church calls that remaining spirit of Jesus, Holy Spirit, with capital letters, like the name of a person. And many Christians regard Holy Spirit as a person, a continuing presence of Jesus with us that promised comforter for whoever is open and welcoming. Now, some Christians, some churchgoers, insist that one has to become a Christian first in order to receive that sacred spirit, that Holy Spirit. But that seems to me like putting the cart before the horse. Because never in Jesus' lifetime, according to the scriptures that I read, did, did he ever withhold grace to outsiders simply because they were outsiders. Quite to the contrary, Jesus often demonstrated an especially kind regard for outsiders. And thus he made a despised Samaritan, the hero, of one of his most famous stories. Therefore, I don't think it makes sense to hold that the spirit of Jesus dwells these days only with insiders, with Christians. Let us then change our perspective as we think about spirit, Thinking of sacred spirit not as one divine person in a holy trinity, which is a, a Christian convention, but rather let us entertain the possibility that sacred spirit abides in outsiders and insiders. It, it abides in people of many faiths, and it abides also in people with no faith, no affiliated religion. The nuns, as we say today, N-O-N-E-S. Polls that map religious affiliation tell us that the nuns are the fastest growing group of people in our society, American society. It's true elsewhere as well. 
You hear this a lot. People say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. What does that mean? What is spirit? Well, here we go. I'm putting on my philosopher's hat. And I confess that I don't truly know what I'm about to tell you. I'm feeling my way. I wade into this murky water uh, asking for your liberty to feel my way. First of all, it seems to me that by spirit, many people have in mind the very deepest part of themselves. That which, when the going really gets tough, when everything is up for grabs, they must decide what is truly, truly most important to them. That is spirit, or some call it soul. Secondly, it seems to me that spirit is the energy that is present in all living things, not just human beings, and not just sentient beings either, meaning creatures, but also in plants. In all living things, there is this natural inclination to keep on living, to endure, to endure hardship, and to procreate, to pass forward the energy of life before one dies. This fundamental energy of living things, I'll call it spirit. Although all living things enjoy spirit as a natural gift, sometimes because of trauma or because of disease, one can become dispirited. One can lose, at least temporarily, a portion of that natural gift, that divine energy. And this can result in both physical exhaustion and mental depression. I do not know any other species other than the human one in which a deep depression can lead to suicide. Suicide, I'm saying, is a spiritual depletion. Although some cultures have contrasted spirit to body, prizing spirit as pure, noble, while body is corrupt and nasty. You've heard that contrast before. Greek dualism. Greeks were known for that. Anyway, it seems to me that spirit and body, to the contrary, are, they belong to each other. They're, they're intermingled. When the body dies, the, the life energy which animated the body changes form. It leaves the body, because the body's gone, it changes form gets recycled somehow, I don't know how. Einstein held, contrary to kind of common sense view of things, that the universe does not consist of matter and energy, but consists entirely of energy. He said everything is energy, and energy cannot be destroyed. It only changes form. I also associate spirit with Grit, not grits, that's a southern dish, with grit. That determination to keep on keeping on, come what may. I won't give up, I won't give up, I won't give up. Thus speaks a spirited person. And I associate spirit with empathy and compassion the will to connect in deeply moving ways to others, the inclination to respect others, and the insistence on being respected in return. And it seems to me, oh, this is so important today, that spirit is marked by a strong commitment to truth and to living according to the truth that one discovers. As George Fox put it, letting our lives speak. This commitment to truthful living involves collaboration with others 
against injustice, and then enduring the recrimination which often follows. Making art is a spiritual activity. The desire to create something beautiful, perhaps a sketch, a, a painting, a sculpture, a tasty dish, to perform a musical selection, or to dance, or to master the movements of a martial art, all of these activities are spiritually motivated. And finally, spirit is what moves a person closer and closer to what a Quaker friend of mine has called the oceanic experience. That is, unity with all that is. When one feels perfectly safe and calm, when one's concerned for defending and protecting, the self totally evaporates. Then one may fall like a raindrop into the ocean and the seeker experiences bliss. How do I know all these things? I said in the beginning, I don't truly know them. I suspect they are true. I'm feeling my way. Aren't we all? Spirit is such a widely distributed gift. It doesn't belong just to the practitioners of any particular religion. It doesn't belong just to animals of any particular species. Where there's life, there's spirit. And spirit is our guru. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your Holy Spirit, which we associate with Jesus. We say that uh, we are still in touch with the Spirit of Jesus in the Comforter. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. But we thank you also that your Spirit is moving in others even before they confess faith. So we pray for your healing in these times, O Sacred Spirit. Times of grave war and want. We pray for your healing. We pray for your sustaining presence. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Turn in your hymnal to page 285, like the murmur of the dove song.
God has given us the gift of faith. Through this gift, we see all people as God's children. Respond to God's generous love that we may love one another as God has loved us. Let us share this love we bring as we bring our tithes and our offerings. We believe in hope and trust God is at work through us. We believe that we can make a difference here and now by the hope we offer and the work we do for the sake of Jesus. You can make a donation on our website at covenantde.org or send a donation to our physical address or put offerings in the collection plate by the door. We give thanks for all your gifts of love and hope. Join me in the prayer of dedication. Loving God, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to bring the peace of Christ. We are grateful that you continually teach us through your Spirit. Help our hearts to be so filled with your peace that our congregation will show forth your goodness to the world around us. Let, Let your, your loving, loving presence be known through our church ministry. Accept these offerings as a sign of our trust in you. In you. For, we, For pray we pray in Jesus', Jesus name. name. Amen. Amen. We see in your bulletin that there is a uh, kind of a, a beige sheet with uh, prayer concerns on it. Uh, quite a quite a list of people uh, in our community and congregation that need our prayerful attention. Uh, I call your attention to the, all of those, and I won't read through them. But we hold them all, as the Quakers would say, we hold them in the light, in God's uh, wonderful light. Uh, and I'd like to call your attention to the top paragraph on that sheet, we grieve with uh, the people of Ukraine, most certainly we do, and all who have died in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And that includes uh, Russian soldiers as well as Ukrainians and, and uh, civilians. Uh, and uh, I, I want to lift up to your attention one particular Ukrainian since the war began, I have been riveted by YouTube videos about what's happening. And uh, early on, I began to watch a Ukrainian interrogator uh, whose name is, uh, Dmitry, correct me if I'm wrong in the pronunciation, Volodymyr Zolkin. And uh, he has recorded many, many interviews with captured Russian soldiers. And I find them just astounding because he's obviously not only gathering military in information, which is the important thing that an interrogator does, but it's clear because of his demeanor and because of his method that he's not just about that. He's trying to understand what has motivated these people and why have they come here and what's happening in their minds and their hearts? I think he, he's truly interested in converging, converting them to, to a reasonable position. 
not to a particular religious position, but certainly to a humane position. And he's carrying a great burden. One can see it in, in his very demeanor in these interviews. So I lift him up to you. His name is Zolkin, last name is Zolkin. Hold him in the light, if you will, because I'm, I'm wondering 10 years down the road, after carrying all of the pain, of all the suffering on both sides, what is going to happen to this man carrying secondary post-traumatic stress? Let's hold him in the light. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the freedom to worship as your spirit moves us to do here. And we pray that over the face of our planet, your spirit may grant that peace and that liberty to praise you in ways that uh, are meaningful to us. We pray for all those who are being persecuted for conscience sake. We pray for all those who have been harmed by war, both by death and missing family members. And we, we pray for those soldiers in captivity who have awakened to what has happened and are truly regretful about it. We pray for their soul healing. We pray for our church in these times uh, times of uh, social unrest and insistence on justice and rebellion. We pray that we may use tools of peaceful persuasion rather than violence to, to find justice. In all these things we pray in the name of Jesus who taught his, his disciples that when they pray they might say this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And our final hymn is, Come, O Spirit, dwell among us.
Now, if you'll join me in the vision statement, we are a congregation, congregation loving, loving God, God, connecting people, changing lives, and, and reflecting Christ, Christ to, to the world. world. Go in peace, Christian people. Go in love, Christian people. Fearing no one and no thing, for you are Easter people. And as you go, have that grit that the Holy Spirit confers. It's not, it's not our strength, it's, it's given to us. Go in peace, go in love, and go with grit because I think there are hard times ahead. Peace.